Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to worship at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church on this Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Friends, as we step deeper into the new year, I want to thank everyone who has made a pledge to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church for 2021. We are now 90% of the way toward our goal. This is really good progress. Although, yes, we still have a ways to go. We need to raise $300,000 in pledges to make our budget for this year. Given past giving patterns, this is totally possible, but we need your help to cross the finish line and to stave off cuts to our vital ministries. If you need help placing a pledge online, if you'd like to make a pledge over the phone, or if you'd simply like us to send you another pledge card because yours has been lost, please call the church at 212-247-0490, extension 3018, and leave a message for Jacqueline Smith. Please pledge today. Thank you and bless you. Next Sunday, we will welcome back to this pulpit the Reverend Patrick O'Connor, pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Jamaica, Queens. First Presbyterian Church Jamaica has partnered with our congregation in mission, adult education events, and in exploring cha relevant challenges and topics together. We are so honored to have Reverend O'Connor as our preacher for Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. If you check out our website, fapc.org, you will see a whole menu of engaging adult education opportunities planned for January and beyond. This week, there's a program by Dan Hale of Johns Hopkins Medical School on depression and hope. Next Sunday evening, we're hosting a webinar on caste and civil rights. We have a virtual winter Sabbath coming up for women focused on wisdom literature. And this month, our community groups will begin to follow a curriculum designed to foster meaningful, honest, and gracious conversations about race and racism. I encourage you to deepen your faith by engaging in at least one of these wonderful opportunities. No matter where you are, you can participate. Register online today. Okay, friends, let's breathe deep, calm our minds, center our hearts with diverse friends near and far, familiar and unknown. Let's lean into the beauty of worship Let's lend our voices to prayer and song. Let's support each other, sharing Christ's peace with each other as we journey through this time. Please join me in the responsive call to worship as it appears on your screen. We are claimed by God who calls us children. We, we the, the redeemed, redeemed have, have been, been called, called by, by name. name. Jesus joins us in the water. The, the rivers, rivers shall not overwhelm us, us for God, God is our guide and, and protector. protector. Let us worship the one who washes us in grace.
friends, the proof of God's love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, having faith in him, we can come to confession, not trembling in fear, but trusting in God's limitless grace. So let us confess to God and one another using the unison prayer of confession that's shown on your screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with a whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Hear the good news that Christ on the cross and in his body has taken on your sin and your shame so that you might be dead to sin, but alive to all that is good. In the name of Jesus Christ, praise God, you are forgiven. You are deeply loved. Amen. Family, we are a forgiven and reconciled people. So let us continue to pass the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The, the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with you. With you and, and also with you. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms. Teach me, I will all your signs at Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My friends, these are strange and unsettling days. In the riotous attack on and occupation of our nation's capital this past week, the very promise of America, this 245-year-old grand experiment in democracy built on peaceful trans transitions of power came under attack. The violence, property damage, desecration of revered public spaces, and overall violation of the rule of law that played out on January 6th in Washington deserves clear and unequivocal condemnation. And if we really want to be like Jesus, all of those involved in this terrible event, politicians, police, innocent bystanders, families of the injured and the dead, and even the rioters themselves warrant our prayers. Something is seriously broken in America. To pray for our country in this moment and for those responsible for Wednesday's violence is not, of course, to condone it. 
In recent days, some have tried to justify the behavior of the rioters by highlighting their righteous anger. This is a precarious pivot, especially for people of faith. The good book teaches us to put away anger, to remove it from our lives. Jesus teaches that those who are angry will be liable to judgment. Psalm 37 admonishes us saying, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Our faith is clear. Violence steeped in anger, stoked by lies is sinful. Its fruits are evil. I said this six months ago in regard to those who used the cover of peaceful protests in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd to engage in vandalism, looting, and other violence. I say it again now. When armed individuals bash in the windows of one of our country's most cherished institutions, disrupt the legal processes, and threaten the elected officials of this land, they are engaging in evil. The good book and the Judeo-Christian tradition take a dim view of such acts, and they take a dim view of those who incite others to such acts. Consider with me for a moment the prophet Hosea. Hosea loved the land of Israel, he was also one of its fiercest critics. Scripture, by the way, has no problem with this algebra. You can be a person of faith, you can love your country, and you can be a critic of your country all at the same time. Once, in explaining why his country had fallen on hard times, the prophet Hosea criticized those in power, kings and princes, saying, they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. All week I've been thinking about these words. They have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. My friends, those who sow disinformation and fan the flames of people's rage plant dangerous seeds. Our outgoing president bears responsibility for the events of the past week. He is not alone. I say this not to score political points. Both my parents were Republicans. Over the course of my political life, I have voted for candidates from both parties and a number of independents too. I say all this out of deep love for this country and its people. Truth matters. Jose is right. When we sacrifice truth to achieve self-serving ends or to try and paint reality as we wish it would appear, we sow the seeds of our own destruction. I pray for all who were involved in the events of this past week, and I pray that we, as a nation, will repent. I pray that we will turn away from this protracted season of playing fast and loose with the truth and demonizing those with whom we disagree. Despite our many differences, I pray that we will all, all, all commit to planting good seeds, truthful seeds, lest we reap a terrible whirlwind, a storm that makes this past week's hooliganism look like a walk in the park. As we consider our next steps, let's turn our hearts now on this baptism of the Lord Sunday to today's text as read by our theater fellowship. Providentially, they are about to tell us the story of another biblical prophet like Hosea who challenged people to repent and bear good fruit. Listen now for God's word to you as it echoes to us from the Gospel of Matthew Chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, 
the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized him, by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill his righteousness. Then John consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God. Today's text describes a classic tent revival. On the bank of a river, a prophetic figure stands, cataloging society's woes and clamoring for people to repent. As we watch, one by one, contrite sinners step forward, entrusting themselves to calloused fingers which pinch their nostrils shut as they are plunged, every bit of them, beneath the moving waters. It's a straightforward, modest ceremony, nothing more than a bath, really, when you think about it, and, and yet something about this basic ritual beckons to people, pulling them from busy lives to make a trip down to the Jordan. What was it, do you think, that compelled all those folk to seek John to go down to the river to pray. My wise friend, the Reverend Tom R. Jr. describes John the Baptist as a first century smoke alarm. His, his preaching shook people out of complacent slumbers and got them moving. They headed down to the river because, because they wanted new direction. They, they wanted to turn and face reality in a new way. They wanted John's simple but powerful ritual. John took something that our, our bodies know so well, that just bathed, tingling, freshly toweled off sensation, and, and replicated it for people's spirits. Dunk, splash, sputter, and from the muddy flow, drenched converts emerged with scoured souls. I, I picture the scene down by the river, <laughs> despite the preacher's focus on sin as a joyful time. There's something heartwarming about people embracing a new path, a new possibility, new morality, and being embraced in that by God. There, there's joy in the air until until John spies a group of local religious leaders approaching his revival, detecting 
a whiff of hypocrisy in the air. After all, these folk weren't out in the streets challenging people to change their ways. John launches into one of the good book's most famous invectives. You brood of vipers, don't you dare approach this water without repenting. Watch your step because all your education and all your social status will not protect you here. Repent, you self-satisfied elitists. God wants results. God wants good fruit. Trees that do not bear good fruit will get the ax. John the Baptist draws a protective circle around his ritual wash. These waters, he asserts, have meaning. This sign has consequences for people. To be doused is to be cleansed of sin to, and to honor your freshly laundered status, you must embrace an ethical path. In the movie, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Three prison, prison escapees flee the law along the back roads of Mississippi during the Great Depression. At one point in their journey, these fugitives come upon a congregation gathered at a wide bend in the river. They've stumbled on a baptismal ceremony. Hearing the earnest hymn singing, holding tight to the promise of redemption, one of the convicts, Delmar, splashes his way out to the preacher and is baptized. Salvation is mine, he shouts. And then he declares that his days of robbing Piggly Wiggly grocery stores are over. John would have approved. Baptism is about repentance. It's about bearing good fruit. But even as John dangles a metaphorical ax over those who would betray the ethics of his watery ritual, someone else walks down to the river. And ironically, for the second time in this chapter, John, the one we affectionately call the baptizer, attempts to talk someone out of getting baptized. It's a scene beloved by Renaissance painters. Jesus picks his way down through the crowds, slowly moving toward the embankment, seeking his cousin, the wild-eyed preacher, and the waters of the Jordan. As Jesus approaches, John protests. I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? John's confusion makes sense. He's just been telling us that, that, that baptism is about repentance. So, so why would the Messiah want anything to do with that? The stainless one doesn't need to be washed. Why does Jesus request baptism at the hand of John? It's an interesting question. Early Christian art, icons, mosaics, and frescoes of this scene at the Jordan River depict Jesus partially submerged in the water. John stands nearby, gently touching the Messiah's head. Above, a lone dove glides down a ray of heaven-sent light, while on shore, angels wait with ready towels for God's beloved Son to emerge. If you look closely at the river in these scenes, you will see that these icons often contain a set of curious figures. There in the water, along with Jesus, you will often find a sprite, a small bearded man carrying a jug. He is the river god, the spirit of the Jordan, the sometimes enemy of humankind. This aqueous figure reminds viewers that water can be dangerous, floods can destroy. In, in some icons, Jesus raises his foot to, to quash this river god. And this isn't the only adversary the Messiah will find in the depths. The river waters in these icons are also frequented by dragons and sea serpents. When Jesus enters the river, he enters a realm infested by the powers of evil and chaos. Where does all this fantastic imagery come from? Well, biblical scholars point out that the first three chapters of Matthew ask the question, who is Jesus? 
Uh, a reader can almost drown in the deluge of answers provided by this gospel. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of King David, the son of Abraham. He's the child of Mary, the offspring of the Holy Spirit. He's Emmanuel, God with us, names upon names. In the first part of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is assigned more titles than a person can bear, and it's not over. As Jesus enters the water, the, the heavens open, the, the Spirit descends, and a voice from on high says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. After all the names have been given, epiphany. God speaks. God names Jesus. And God's name for Jesus sounds mighty familiar. It sounds a lot like the person God describes in the book of Isaiah. Here is my servant, God says to Isaiah, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will be gentle. He will not break a bruised reed, and yet he will fight for what is right. He will bring light and freedom to the blind and the shackled. Those who painted the, the river icons with their, their river gods and, and, and coiled serpents knew Isaiah's prophecies. They believed God's anointed was coming to do battle with evil. So when Jesus wades into the Jordan, they nod. God would never invite people to plunge into the water and fight the dragons alone. The baptized Christ enters the river to stand shoulder to shoulder with all who want to repent, with all who want to push back against the forces of chaos. This past Thursday, at about four o'clock in the morning, after the Capitol had been cleared and the Electoral College vote had been certified, the women and men we have elected to political office, people who disagree so fiercely and so constantly and so publicly with each other, stood quietly with their heads bowed as the chaplain of the Senate, Barry C. Black, prayed. These tragedies, the chaplain intoned, have reminded us that words matter and that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Help us to see in each other a common humanity. Use us to bring healing and unity to our hurting and divided nation and world when the good reverend and retired rear admiral in the Navy finished, you could hear a pin drop. Maybe, my friends, maybe all it takes in the middle of our deep divisions, shocked by our capacity for violence, riven by racism, is someone quietly encouraging us to embrace words of life over words of death. Someone encouraging us to turn and face the forces of chaos together. And to be clear, I'm no longer talking about those who invaded the Capitol. I'm talking about feeding the hungry, providing economic opportunity and safe educational spaces for our children, providing counsel for the addicted, providing hope for those who see no hope, and justice for those who see no justice. I'm talking about battling sea serpents alongside our dripping wet God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, give us the courage and comfort that comes from being claimed by you in the waters of baptism. Enlist us in the battle against the forces of chaos alongside our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are are gifts from God. From our life to our breath, our friendships and our financial resources, God has blessed us. 
We give not as though we can pay God back. We give out of gratitude. One of the ways that this church uses your gifts is to support the work of our unmatched facilities and maintenance team. Joining us now is some of this team. Hi, everyone. During a typical program year, all of us on team facilities are working all week long to make spaces throughout the church building safe, orderly, clean, and hospitable for all members, staff, visitors, and guests who walk through our doors every day of the week. This also includes spaces that people may not get to see each Sunday. Deborah will tell you more about facilities and maintenance. Hi, everyone. During this time of COVID-19, our entire Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church facilities team has followed CDC protocol to keep the building safe and secure. This safety is to protect staff members and outreach programs, such Meals on Heels volunteers, and our friends who are standing in line each for a place at the table. Our team also supports online worship and efforts to prepare for live streaming when we return to worshiping in person. There are two easy ways that you can give online to support the many wonderful ministries of this church. Just go to fapc.org give or text the word FAPC give to 77977. From all of us at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, thank you so much for your generosity. Will you pray with me, friends? Loving God, we welcome you into this place we welcome you into our homes, into our lives, into our hearts, asking that you would make your presence known to us both today and throughout the coming week. We thank you, Lord, for another day of life, for this new year, for the promise of a miraculous, persistent, won't abandon us no matter what eternal hope, despite the chaos, the disorder, the destruction we face. Gracious God, we humbly offer prayers of support to the many suffering and hurting in our world. For the lonely and the heartbroken, we pray for your comfort and your peace. For the sick and the tired, we pray for your grace and your strength. For the persecuted and defenseless, we pray for your stamina and your justice. For the confused and the disoriented, we pray for your wisdom and guidance. Mysterious creator, we're standing on the brink of a full year that has been emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually demanding. Every day, the news, the notifications, the tweets, moments of anxiety around politics and pandemics so thick, so intense, it's hard to breathe. There are moments, dear Lord, when many of us feel as if we're left with nothing. No more patience, no more energy, no more fight, no more hope, and even sometimes no more love. And God, we need you to sustain us, to revive us, to hold us, to reorient us, to call us to your marvelous service in love of neighbor and in bringing about your kingdom, which knows no sickness, no suffering, no delusion, no injustice, no end. Patient God, in this troubling time of political division, uncertainty, amid the shouts, the name calling, the retorts, the blaming, we ask that you would teach us to listen. Teach us to listen to those far from us, the whisper of the hopeless, the plea of the forgotten, the cry of the anguished. Teach us to listen, O oh God, to ourselves. Help us to be less afraid to trust the voice inside. Teach us to listen, Holy Spirit, for your voice in busyness and in boredom, in certainty and doubt, in noise and in silence. Teach us, O oh Lord, to listen, to hear, to live the words that Christ himself taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My baptized friends, have courage in this time. Hold fast to what is good. Do not return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs> 